Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again for Honors Biology video 11-3. And in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the respiratory system. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about the different structures in the respiratory system. So nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, lungs, alveoli. I'm also gonna talk about the movement of gases into the body and out of the body. And also we'll talk about how oxygen moves around the body and some of the possible homeostatic challenges that will come up that the respiratory system has to deal with. All right, so here we go. So let's talk about the various structures of the respiratory system. So let's first describe the pathway of air into the body and then out of the body. And let's, we'll bring in the role of the diaphragm. So what we'll see is the pathway of air into the body is that you're going to breathe in through the nose. That air is going to go down the trachea. It's going to branch into the bronchus as it enters the lungs. And eventually it will get down into these little tiny air sacs called alveoli. Then when you breathe out, the air will be pushed out of the alveoli, back up into the bronchioles and the bronchus, up the trachea, and then out the nose or the mouth. So what's the role of the diaphragm in this? The diaphragm is a smooth muscle that is on the underside of your rib cage. And what it does is when it contracts, it pulls down. And that pulling down is gonna increase the volume within the lung cavity. As a result of that pulling down and increasing that volume, air is going to be drawn in. When that muscle relaxes, it's going to push up and it's going to make the size of that cavity smaller. As a result of the cavity getting smaller, air is going to be pushed out of the lungs. So how does oxygen and carbon dioxide enter and leave the body. So I showed you the pathway and as I was describing the pathway, I was describing the pathway of oxygen in. So again, you breathe in, it goes through the nose, down the trachea, down the bronchus, through the bronchioles, down at the alveoli. This air that we're breathing in is the air from the atmosphere. So it's roughly 20% oxygen. Now there's very little carbon dioxide out in the atmosphere. And so when we bring in this 20% oxygen, there's going to be a high concentration of oxygen in the alveoli. The blood that is in the capillaries that surrounds the alveoli, this is going to be very oxygen poor blood. This is going to be blood, if you remember back from the last video, this is going to be blood that is being pumped from the right side of the heart through that pulmonary artery. And that's again, oxygen poor blood. So there's going to be a difference in oxygen levels between the alveoli and that blood in those capillaries. And as a result of that difference, oxygen will diffuse into the bloodstream. Similarly, that blood that is coming from the right side of the heart is going to be very carbon dioxide rich and the atmosphere is very carbon dioxide poor. So the air that is brought into those alveoli from the outside is going to have a very low concentration of CO2. You're going to have a very high concentration of CO2 in the blood and the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood into the alveoli. Then when you go to breathe out, you're now going to be breathing out CO2 rich air. So that CO2 is going to go up from the alveoli through the bronchioles, through the bronchus, up the trachea, up the nose, and then through the nose and then out into the atmosphere. And as a result, you're going to be bringing oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. So let's trace those molecules in the body. So we've already kind of gone over how do you get the oxygen. So again, you bring the the air from the, al uh, from the outside down through that respiratory system into the alveoli and it diffuses into the bloodstream. What happens once it gets into that bloodstream? Well, what you're going to see is that you'll have blood cells that have hemoglobin on them. And hemoglobin is a protein that is found on red blood cells that has a high affinity and binds to oxygen molecules. So now this oxygen is going to be carried through the bloodstream in the blood plasma throughout the entirety of the body. And at the various tissues of your body, you're going to have this higher concentration of oxygen in the bloodstream and a lower concentration in the tissues of the body. And so we're going to see the oxygen is going to detach from hemoglobin and it's going to diffuse into that plasma and diffuse across the tissues of the body into cell tissues. Now, why would your cells want oxygen? Well, as you know, oxygen is important to cell respiration. And so the cells of the body, when they break down sugars, are going to utilize oxygen in that cell respiration. And as a result of that, they're also going to produce CO2. 
Now, just like when we saw what happened in the alveoli, when there's a high concentration of CO2 in the tissues of the body from cell respiration being a product, it's going to diffuse into the bloodstream. And then once it's in the bloodstream, it will be carried back to the right side of the heart and then pumped back to the lungs. And so now we can go back to this other diagram that we have with the alveoli. And what we see is that there's CO2 in the blood. And the reason there's CO2 in the blood is because the activities that happen in the tissues of the body that are producing those CO2 through cell respiration. So hopefully you can make a connection between the respiration involving the respiratory system, where we're bringing oxygen in and breathing carbon dioxide out, and the cellular respiration that happens in the tissues of the body, and how those are connected and connect the oxygen molecules from one location to the other. So this leads us to another parallel we see, which is the use of these capillaries in the various systems of the body. So here's a time where I'd like you to pause and think. The villi of the small intestine and the alveoli of the lungs both have materials crossing the membrane and interacting. Both have materials crossing membranes and they interact with the bloodstream. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause and think. What is one similarity between these structures and what is one difference? Pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you came up with in terms of the similarities is that the similarities involve the movement from an area of high concentration to low concentration, which is diffusion. Both in the case of the villi of the intestines, where we see materials from that we digested um, from our food crossing the intestinal lining and getting into the capillaries, and the movement of oxygen and CO2 across the membrane of the alveoli and the bloodstream. Diffusion is what's driving this. These are passive transports where materials are going from high concentration to low concentration. One of the key differences we see is the directionality. So with the alveolus, we see materials moving in both directions. We see materials entering the bloodstream and materials leaving the bloodstream. But when we contrast that with what we see in the villi, we really only see materials entering the bloodstream. We see things like glucose, or we see fatty acids and glycerol. We see the subunits that we digested from our food entering into capillaries, but we don't see materials diffusing out of those capillaries back into the small intestine. It's really only a one direction flow that we're seeing this diffusion of materials. All right, so this leads us to our last uh, pause and think our last thought questions. And this has to do with homeostasis. And the diagram over on the far right hand side may help you. This talks about the acid based homeostatic balance that your body is dealing with. And acidosis is when your bloodstream becomes acidic, pH is driven down, and alkalosis is what happens when the pH goes up and you're dealing with a basic solution uh, within the tissues of the body. We're really going to focus only on one of these, the acidosis side. So one, the first question I'd like you to think about is what gas causes blood pH to go down? What causes you to have more acidic blood? And then the second question I'd like you to think about is how does the body respond to the change in pH? Why does this help the body maintain homeostasis? Why don't you pause and think? All right, so hopefully what you came up with is that is the gas that causes blood pH to go down is carbon dioxide. And this is actually a really nice parallel with what we talked about when we referred to global warming with CO2 levels going up and that when you have increased CO2 in the atmosphere, a lower pH. And again, it's the same idea that the CO2 with the water forms carbonic acid. Well, similarly, when you breathe in um, if you were to breathe in CO2 or you were to produce a lot of CO2 through cell respiration, as a result of more CO2 being in the bloodstream, you're going to see the pH of your blood go down and become more acidic. Now, what is the result of that? So the way your body responds to an increase of CO2 or a decrease in pH, a more acidic bloodstream, is it's going to cause your respiration to increase. This is going to cause you to breathe more rapidly. Breathing more rapidly will bring more oxygen, hopefully, into the lungs so that you can have that oxygen diffuse across the bloodstream into those capillaries and diffuse some of that CO2 out. So you're going to be ridding the body of the CO2 and 
bringing in oxygen to the bloodstream. This is going to help maintain homeostasis because it's going to hopefully drive up the pH from an acidic environment back to the neutral environment. Blood tends to be happy around 7.4. And so the goal is to get the pH back in balance and get it back to a bloodstream of a, uh, a blood pH of about 7.4. You really have very low tolerance for variation in blood pH um, within your body. In fact, if you make your blood more acidic or more basic uh, than 7.4 very much, um, you can lead to some significant health issues. So your blood works, um, your, your respiratory system helps to maintain this blood pH by modifying your respiratory rate to maintain homeostasis. All right, so I hope that was helpful to everybody, and I'll talk to you all soon.